And so today we have um, a special guest speaker. So uh, Dr. Eric Travis, uh, Eric, so is it Eric Fort Travis or Eric Travis? It's Eric Ford Travis. Ford is my middle name. Yeah. We had a colleague here at my department who was just Eric Ford. So period. So that's, yes. And so that's University of Montevallo in yeah. Alabama, if I understand Alabama, correctly. Right? Yes. It's Alabama's liberal arts university. Very nice. And so today he will talk about probably the most important topic of international business, which is culture. No matter what they say, as the quote goes, uh, international business is, after all, basically studying the effects of culture on business. And so the, 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 the all important question, what is culture? So uh, what is it? Why it matters? Um, so I'm turning the microphone to the guest speaker, please. OK, good morning, everybody. Uh, buenos dias, bon dia. Um, for everybody down in Brazil, that's where I did my PhD. I am a management professor. However, my undergraduate was in cultural anthropology. So I really do believe that there's a cultural basis for all human activity and business and politics. And especially when you're involved in international business, it's, it's definitely the most fundamental aspect of doing business is understanding the culture of your employees as well as of your customers and your partners. Uh, let me ask real quick if I do have a PowerPoint, so I, I'm wanting to share a few slides. The other slides are mostly uh, words, but there are a few images that I would yes. like to share. So there is a button at the bottom of the screen that says share, and it should show your slides, so, so that should work okay, very well. There we go. It seems like it's already sharing. Uh, we don't. Um, so let's go ahead and just start with some, let's see, are we going okay now? Yep, we are good. All right, so let's start with a few basic aspects about what is culture from an anthropological perspective. So culture is all of the shared material and non-material aspects of a society that define that society and also distinguish it from other societies. So every aspect of human life, including the art, the architecture, the clothing, what is acceptable in terms of attire, as well as the different roles within that society. Uh, so the different roles assigned to men, to women, to different professional positions. Uh, and most importantly, the ideas, the values, the belief systems, uh, the norms and behaviors where everyone is expected to behave in a certain fashion, otherwise you are considered to be antisocial uh, or violating cultural norms. A lot of these are very uh, simple concepts on the surface, but once you dig deep beneath the surface, it becomes much more complicated. Now, culture has to be learned. So you learn this from primarily your parents, your, your nuclear family, but also from broader society, so you are taught. No one is actually born with culture. Uh, con culture conditions behavior, meaning that it does uh, help control behavior, it does predispose individuals within certain societies to behave in certain manners, to believe certain things are good, certain things are bad, but it is not de deterministic, and this is because humans, we are reflective, we can look at our situation, we can look and see if there's things that we agree with or we don't agree with, uh, and then we're able to act and be an agent for change uh, for the things that we don't necessarily agree with. But we are always conditioned uh, as a, a way of our, our programming. Our brains have been programmed by culture to behave in certain ways. Now, culture also adapts and evolves over time. And this is primarily through that agency, through the individual members of a culture interacting uh, and creating continuous small changes uh, but it's also changed through diffusion. So cultural diffusion is where uh, two different cultures or more cultures overlap and share ideas, and each one is altered in a way by the others. Uh, this is extremely important in modern times with the uh, extensive globalization that we've experienced. Uh, and of course, you do have subcultures. So within any national culture, you have smaller cultures. They can be regional cultures. Uh, they can be based on ethnicity, occupation, sex, gender, sexuality, all these various uh, smaller demographics that have their own cultures that are part of the broader culture. Um, the most fundamental aspect, again, from an anthropological perspective, the most fundamental aspect of culture is language. And there's something called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. And this is the idea that language and culture are inextricably linked. You cannot separate them. Uh, to the extent that we're not even able to think about anything without referring back to the language and the words that we have in our brains to be able to conceive those thoughts. So the language that we learn and the languages that we learn change the way that we think. And this is also why I uh, definitely push students of mine and friends of mine to learn more than one language. It does literally broaden your mind. 
at a minimum, language influences all thought and action. Uh, if you're a believer in the strong Worf hypothesis uh, perspective, you would say that language and culture actually control our thought and our action uh, by giving us cognitive categories and associations. And these limit our abilities to even consider other options or other perspectives or other explanations. So what we have learned culturally, what we have learned through our culture actually acts as a filter through which we interpret the entire environment and our entire lives. Uh, and everything that we experience, everything that we see, we have to force into one of the existing categories, otherwise it's very difficult for us to interpret it. And this is where you get a lot of cultural uh, miscommunication. And this is because everyone does have their cultural perspective and they might be fitting the same phenomenon into different categories depending upon the perspective. Um, so when we actually look at new information, we do have to force it into these categories and associations. Now there's a link there, I'm not gonna click on it, but feel welcome to follow up after the webinar to, to see exactly to the extent uh, that this is true. Even Would colors. To get Pardon? copies of the slides um, after the presentation for the students? Pardon? Uh, would it be possible to get a copy of the slides? Of course, of course. Yeah, I'll send you a copy right after. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so even colors are seen through a cultural filter. And the idea that certain cultures do not distinguish between, for example, the colors blue and green, that those are in one single category. So if you show them uh, objects that have a, a blue or a green color, then they would actually say they are the same color. Uh, and some languages that don't have differences in color between light green and dark green, but others actually com consider them to be completely different colors. Uh, you also have certain positive or negative associations with different aspects of life uh, or different categories. Uh, others might have specific orders or causality relationships with the associations and the phenomenon. So in Mandarin, for example, the number four is very similar to the word for dead or death. So, and I'm not, I don't speak Mandarin, but su and su is the best way I can pronounce it. Uh, and so you have this association uh, that is also seen as being a negative association or a uh, inauspicious association because of the association between uh, the two words in the language. Uh, this here, just one of the, the reasons I wanted to have the PowerPoint to show students as well, a visible symbol. Symbols are very important in culture. So interpreting the visual, not just the uh, language aspects, but the visual symbols in our lives. For most of you looking at this, you might look and say, hey, that looks like the Empire States Building. And that is a, a reasonable interpretation. So if you have seen King Kong, or if you've been to New York City, or if you've seen various films and movies, you would associate this at least with a skyscraper or with King Kong the movie. Um, but if, let's say that you aren't from a culture that has multi-story buildings and you haven't had access to television or the internet, so you haven't seen some of the uh, movies or films, you might actually associate this with being a hypodermic needle. So you have students, you have uh, individuals from around the world, and this is actually an example from my mother. She was a school teacher here in Alabama, and there was a child who did not recognize a line drawing of a skyscraper because they had never been exposed to it. So putting the image into their cultural reference, you can see how it actually can look like uh, a hypodermic needle. So the symbols even, our interpretation of the world, uh, we definitely have heuristics and we have certain categories or ideas that shape the way that we think. Companies really need to pay attention to this to understand how both their employees, but especially their clients and their customers will interpret uh, their products, their marketing campaigns, their advertising, for example. Now this is a Nike tennis shoe, Nike Air to be exact, from back in around 1997. Uh, and there was a scandal involving Nike back at that time. So many people would look at this and say, well, what's controversial about a tennis shoe? Uh, the Nike swoosh is pretty much ubiquitous. Everyone around the world uh, pretty much knows Nike, just like some of the other uh, international brands like Coca-Cola. But if you look at the word Air, which is one of their product lines, Nike Air, uh, the script that was used uh, was, we would say, cultural misappropriation. So borrowing something from another culture uh, and then using it in a way that is either inappropriate or offensive. And in this case, it was both. 
So if you are from a Muslim country or Muslim background, and especially if you speak or read Arabic, you would see that there's a very close resemblance between the Nike Air logo uh, and the word Allah for God. And so this is extremely offensive, not necessarily because you're using the word Allah on apparel. There is acceptable apparel in different countries with Allah on t-shirts or on uh, hats, for example. But in particular, the feet are considered to be unclean. Uh, and the bottom of the feet, the soles of the feet, are the most unclean part. So this is very much an insult uh, to God from that perspective. And for a company as international and as experienced as Nike to make this kind of a mistake uh, really does cause a lot of problems. And they apparently haven't learned because just this year there's another uh, controversy where they have also included something similar in the Air Max line. Uh, so uh, history is repeating itself. Also, uh, certain symbols and gestures and nonverbal communication uh, can have different meanings in different countries. And so you need to be aware of this when you're engaging with uh, people from other cultures and the communication. So if you're from America, you probably know rock on, the devil horns for heavy metal or for rock. And this is actually the symbol in many other countries uh, Northern Europe especially is known for using this for their rock concerts. Uh, but depending on where you're from, you might interpret it otherwise. So here's George Bush, and he's doing a very similar symbol. This is actually for a college football in America. It's called Hook'em Horns. So the Texas University of Texas Longhorns football team, or their general sports program, that is their mascot, uh, the Longhorn Cattle. So a very similar symbol with a completely different meaning. And if you're interpreting that they are devil horns and the President of the United States does them, I, there might be an interpretation that, well, the President of the United States is showing the sign of the devil. Of course, if you go to Hawaii, you might have something that's more of a hang loose, but it looks similar. So this is surfer culture. So Hawaii is where uh, Obama was born. Uh, and he, he uses the hang loose symbol there in that picture. Uh, and then, of course, in other cultures, such as in Hindu culture, there is actually something Karana Mudra, and I'm not sure exactly if I'm pronouncing that right, but the same hand signal or hand sign, and it's used as a ward against uh, either misfortune or against evil. So this is actually a way to protect yourself uh, from curses or from uh, misfortune. And that's also been carried through into many of the Mediterranean cultures, probably through cultural diffusion, uh, with India being a, a much older, or Hindu uh, cultures being a much older culture uh, related to most of the modern European cultures. So probably the origins are in the Indo-Aryan uh, language and culture. Um, because in the Mediterranean countries as well, you can use the sign either as a curse or as a protective uh, symbol to ward off the evil eye, the olio gordo or malocchio in uh, Italian or Portuguese. Uh, so we do have different symbols. Here's one of our current president here in the United States. I'm guilty of using this inappropriately when I travel in Latin America. Here in America, it means okay. In Latin America, it's actually a very vulgar sign. So if I'm communicating with some of my friends and they say, hey, let's go hang out or I'm going to come over to your house later and I say, okay, I'm actually saying something pretty negative to them. Uh, so even the nonverbal communication is, is very important and very much needs attention, especially uh, in marketing and advertising. Getting to some basic concepts, and I'm moving right along because I know we have a limited time and we need to get to the question and answer. Actually, I love this topic so much. Feel free to take a little more time. I've seen this okay. topic presentation many times. That's the first time I see these examples and analogies. So please do take extra time if you need it. I personally enjoy it so much. I, I really enjoy teaching and talking about culture. I introduce most of my courses with a talk on culture. So whether I'm talking about just general management or marketing or international courses, I do bring a cultural component the first week of class so that standard students can understand how important this is. Um, when we get into uh, how culture shapes our interactions, for example, everyone is guilty of self-reference criterion, so the acronym SRC. This is where we use our own culture to view and judge other cultures. And this is how we basically try to fit what we experience from other cultures into our own paradigms and then say, well, whether or not this is good or bad, acceptable or unacceptable, 
uh, everyone is guilty of this and self-reference criteria itself is not wrong. When it extends to what we call ethnocentrism, where you believe that your culture is superior to others or your way of life or your actions are superior to the other culture's beliefs and actions, that's where you cross the line. Uh, from a cultural relativism perspective, all cultures are equal qualitatively uh, because cultures are a reaction to the environment, a reaction to the uh, evolution of a given society. So they are appropriate for that context, for that society. Uh, and if you take things out of context and place them into another cultural context, you lose their meaning, you lose understanding uh, the meanings behind the actions and the words. Uh, the most common aspect of self-reference criterion, of course, is uh, food. This is something that's very easy to explain and pretty much everyone has experienced it at some time in their life, uh, either directly where you would be exposed to a food that you normally wouldn't eat at home or in your home country, uh, or whether you've seen on television where they have some of the exotic uh, food TV shows from different cuisines from around the world. So what is culturally acceptable to eat in one country might be considered taboo in another country or simply unpalatable or unappealing. Um, growing up in Alabama, we pretty much ate everything. So I didn't have much of a self-reference criteria with food, or at least I didn't think I did until I was in Brazil for the first time. Uh, and then the central west part of the country in Goiás, my in-laws served me uh, at a party, something called tattoo, and I didn't know what tattoo was. Uh, so I ate it, and then later I looked in the dictionary. At that time, I wasn't fluent in Portuguese, so I looked in the dictionary to find out, and it was an armadillo. And that's definitely not something that we eat here in Alabama or most of the United States. Um, but it was delicious. So of course, I've eaten it many times since then. Uh, but if I had known beforehand what tattoo was, other than just looking like shredded meat, uh, barbecued meat, I would definitely would not have eaten it. Um, so the, the self-reference criteria helps us to try to, uh, we would say, reinforce our own cultural values, as well as to try to um, fit other cultures within our own culture. And the best way to expand your horizons is to try to overcome some of your self-reference criteria and to look at other cultures, other actions, uh, and other communication within their original cultural context. So looking at it from the Brazilian perspective, tattoo is a, an acceptable, or armadillo is an acceptable cuisine. Um, ethnocentrism, as I mentioned before, is where you get a little bit too far with that. And this is actually a cause of a lot of the conflict that we see today geopolitically. Um, not just conflict over resources, but the nationalism that's rising in different parts of the world. And this is based on the, the belief that their culture, their way of life is threatened by other cultures, by the influx of immigrants, uh, by globalization, the pressures that come along with that. Uh, and so this causes a rise in nationalism to try to protect their culture and say that their culture is better. Uh, a couple of other concepts when you're looking at it from a research perspective, uh, the EMIC would be the viewpoint from a member's perspective. So myself, being from the United States and being from Alabama, uh, I look at the world from that original perspective. So my emic perspective is about the American culture and the Alabama culture. Now, edic would be viewpoint from the observer's perspective, from the outsider. And so if I was to go to Japan or if I was to observe uh, interaction between Japanese individuals, um, I would be using an edic or an outsider's perspective. Now, what that means is I would be forced to place my interpretations within my own self-reference criterion, within my own cultural paradigms, because I would not understand the context of the foreign or the other culture. Um, a few more specific aspects that relate directly to business and especially organizational behavior. Uh, Hofstede, he's a famous social psychologist, probably the most famous researcher into culture uh, as it applies to the business environment and markets. And he originally came up with the first four of these distances, where you have power distance, individualism, collectivism, uncertainty avoidance, and masculinity, femininity. Uh, and then a little while later, probably around 10, 15 years later, due both to criticism as well as additional research from other researchers and from Hofstede, 
he added two additional dimensions, time orientation and then indulgence versus restraint, to try to help explain some of the cultural differences uh, in business between the Western countries and the uh, Eastern or Asian countries. Um, now these have been tested extensively, most of them have still held true, uh, and definitely are, are useful in trying to understand uh, behavior of employees, behavior and relationships between managers and subordinates, uh, as well as even uh, understanding investors and consumers. So if we go through these, power distance is basically the acceptable level of distance between superior subordinates. Uh, and in a general sense, in a given society, between the haves and the have-nots, between the elite and the poor, for example. Uh, and you generally have uh, the, the Latin American and some of the other more developing nations, you have a very high power distance. Uh, in the Western countries, United States, uh, we have a lower power distance. Um, we also think we're lower than we really are. There's a follow-up, a different professor with other researchers, the uh, GLOBE study, um, actually extended upon these and added a few other dimensions, as well as comparing the ideal versus the reality. So here in the United States, of course, we have the ideal of a low power distance, but reality, we have a slightly higher power distance than we think we do. Uh, individualism, collectivism, when you get into these aspects, the more individualistic societies are focused more on uh, their own well-being, the individual's well-being, or the close friends and family at most, individual achievement, collectivist, or, excuse me, collectivist cultures, and therefore organizations from those cultures in general, are more about the group uh, identity and about group-based achievement, uh, and making sure that you have group harmony and uh, focused on group or organizational strategies and goals instead of individual strategies and goals. Uh, and that, of course, is very important when you're dealing with human resource management, when you're dealing with uh, team management and with reward and compensation systems. Uh, uncertainty avoidance is the, uh, the level of acceptable ambiguity for any given culture. So some cultures very much do not perform well in contexts where there is not, uh, or there are not clearly defined rules and regulations or clearly defined guidelines for behavior and for communication. And in generally those societies, uh, you do require more explicit uh, management styles and a little bit more micromanagement or at least very clear job descriptions uh, and guidelines for behavior. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because my next slide has some of this information as well. Uh, masculinity, femininity, this isn't man or woman, but this is the general traits that are associated with being masculine uh, in certain cultures that identify with that in terms of aggressiveness, in terms of direct competition versus more feminine cultures that are more about cooperation uh, as well as about general welfare uh, of the organization and of society. Uh, time orientation, uh, long versus short term. Generally, you can assume that the Eastern countries, the Asian countries, have a longer term perspective, a longer time orientation, and the Western European um, heritage cult countries have more of a short term orientation. And some of this has to do, of course, with uh, historical context going back thousands of years. I guess the best way that I can explain this is when you're really young, if you're a kid, uh, you focus on the moment. You really have a short-term view of life. Everything seems to be happening at a very, very rapid pace, and um, you, you don't really pay attention to the longer-term history or future. Whereas if you're older, like I am, uh, you actually look back and you say, well, today is just a small part of a longer period of time. Uh, and you tend to be a little bit more pragmatic and focus a little bit more on historical context. Uh, so the Asian cultures, if you look at China and how long that culture has been cohesive, uh, at least in some form, you can go back thousands of years, uh, whereas most of the European cultures and, and countries are much more recent. America, officially, we're only around 245 years old, so definitely a young country. Um, finally, indulgence versus restraint. How, how likely the individuals in a given culture are to indulge in their self-gratification in terms of uh, paying money, for example, to buy something they want right now instead of saving for the future, 
as well as in their personal behavior and their expressiveness. Uh, do they act based on uh, individual um, personality without regard for the larger group or the broader society? Uh, or do they focus on what is culturally acceptable uh, and restraining their behavior and actions so as to not upset the social balance? Uh, a few examples, uh, a few examples extend these. And you can actually go to garretthofstede.com and do comparisons. This is actually a very interesting website. So if you, I don't think you can click on the link because I believe I saved this as an image file. So type in that link when you get the PowerPoint after this webinar. And you can actually select different countries, up to four different countries at a time, and compare them based upon these different cultural dimensions. And it'll show you uh, the relative uh, weights for each one of these for the different countries, as well as give you a more specific and explicit explanation for each country. So it's interesting to go there. Uh, but in terms of individualism versus collectivism, uh, how this plays out. Individualistic cultures tend to overconfidence. So a individual from an individualistic country, if they were asked to rate themselves, uh, would rate themselves as being much higher on a scale of one to 10 than a individual from a collectivist culture. Um, and the, I remember one uh, anecdote about this was professors here in the United States when asked, um, are they an above average professor? 94% of professors said that they are above average professors, um, which is interesting in terms of uh, statistics. So you also look and see collectivist cultures are much more um, towards modesty, the individuals. And this plays out even in terms of doing market research and surveys. So if you ask a, an individual from an individualistic culture, uh, on a scale of one to 10 to give an evaluation, they would be much more likely to go to the extremes, whereas the uh, individual from a collectivist culture would probably be more likely to be somewhere in the mid to mid upper range. Their range would be a little bit uh, more narrow. Uh, individuals uh, from individualistic cult cultures as well tend to focus on parts within a system. So even when interpreting the environment, they focus on the individual components rather than on the system as a whole or the context. And it's the exact opposite from a collectivist perspective, where you look at the relationships and interrelationships among the different components or parts of a system, including people, for example. Uh, so the background or the uh, relationships that are happening. Um, already have covered the uncertainty avoidance in the workplace. Uh, feminine cultures, one other aspect you might be considered or uh, might be considered important you might be, need to pay more attention to some of the fringe benefits for workers to so make sure the health care, the vacation time, the um, other kinds of support for your workers, uh, even if they are not required by law, which they often are in more of the feminine culture countries, you might have to do it in order to satisfy or attract and retain top quality talent. And then finally, another example, indulgence and restraint directly affects willingness to use credit. So if a business requires credit from its uh, consumers, such as for large or big ticket items, individuals from more restrained cultures will not access or use that credit. Uh, and this also affects savings rates in different countries, the amount that each individual uh, out of their paycheck will put in savings toward the future versus spending uh, today. And then finally, the last aspects of culture that I'm gonna cover, uh, come from Hall, and he is an anthropologist, not a social psychologist. He came up with three, uh, three um, cultural aspects of context, space, and then time. Now, context refers to communication, whether or not it is a high or low context communication culture. In a high context communication culture, you actually have a lot of implicit information. The verbal communication is a minimum or a minor part of the entire message. So you end up having to read between the lines. Uh, and part of this does relate generally to a idea of collectivism as well uh, versus individualism. So you're not wanting to, um, you're wanting to give some wiggle room for the under, other individual to respond. That's part of the, the reasoning behind this. But also, there are so many possible interpretations of relationships 
uh, that giving this, this extra room for interpretation is important. But in that kind of a communication, a high context communication, you definitely have to pay attention to nonverbal communication. So the eye contact, the body language, um, as well as understand where uh, the individual is coming from uh, as a perspective. So here in the United States, we are a low context culture, which generally corresponds with Northern and Western Europe uh, and their countries with their heritage. Uh, where we are very explicit with our words, we say what we mean, we're very direct. So you would know, get two people from different contexts of communication, high versus low. Someone from Japan discussing something uh, with someone from Germany, for example, you can have a lot of cultural miscommunication. Um, next would be space and proxemics. And of course, proxemics can be the physical space between two individuals. So in terms of how close do you stand when you communicate with each other? How much body contact is there? Um, in some cultures, here in America, we generally have a arm's length, so about maybe 18 to 24 inches of personal space. And this is our private personal space. You're not supposed to invade it. We put our hands out to shake in front of us. Uh, in some other cultures, Latin, Middle Eastern, uh, African cultures in particular, the space is much smaller and people tend to communicate much more closely in close proximity to the extent that in certain Middle Eastern and African cultures, you might be eight inches from mouth to ear, so almost face to face or cheek to cheek. Now that makes someone from a uh, larger space culture very uncomfortable. Uh, but they call it the dance. When you have someone who needs to be close to feel comfortable when they're communicating, steps in close to someone who needs more space, that person then steps back. So neither one are comfortable with the amount of space between them. Uh, you, this also plays over into the office environment. So in terms of furniture location, furniture style, uh, how acceptable cubicles are, for example, do you need a more uh, private individual uh, space or a more communal space. And then finally, the third aspect from Hall is time and what he divides into monochronic versus polychronic. Uh, and don't confuse that with monochromic versus polychromic, which is referring to color. So monochronic is where you do something and you do things one at a time and you have a linear, linear uh, order to events. Uh, you definitely try to finish one thing before moving on to another. Uh, and also time is very important. So punctuality is very important in a monochronic culture versus a polychronic culture where you're able to focus on multiple things at once and uh, shift your priorities as the environment changes. Uh, and time is not uh, definitely orderly or linear. Um, you focus more on the relationships uh, and on final goals and objectives. Uh, and a lot of that relates back to historical aspects of stability uh, in those respective cultures and countries. We could say even in terms of um, economic stability. So in Brazil, back in the 90s, when you had very high inflation rates approaching 2,500%, uh, you definitely could not have been monochronic. You had to deal with things when you were able to deal with them, especially if you're in finance or banking and had to worry about investments or stock trades. Uh, you had to do it when it was available or when you were able to rather than when you planned on doing something. So again, different aspects of culture fit within uh, their cultural context, within their cultural environments. And if you try to take them out of that context, uh, you lose a lot of the meaning and the understanding. And uh, vice versa, if you try to apply a foreign cultural context, uh, into uh, a domestic context, quite often it does not work. And I believe that is the end. So let me go ahead and close yeah, we that. Have, and we back. have a bunch of questions and very little time. So I would like to ask a few questions here um, that are persistently asked. So Tehas uh, and Samram and Mehak ask basically the same question. And that is, sure. uh, are there any uh, resources or what a company can do to identify the symbols or the words that have a meaning that may be negative. So basically, is there a book that they can read or is there something they can do that can prevent them from making those cultural blunders uh, like uh, Nike swoosh uh, and the name of Allah or, or some other examples that you gave? 
Sure. Um, there are there is not actually a single book that covers all of the cultures in the world. So you would need to actually focus on each individual country or culture, and then the uh, relevant books or research that has been done on those cultures. So you can do the research via the internet. Uh, there are some websites. There's a a very interesting one that shows the different hand signs and hand signals around the world and what they mean. Uh, but more importantly, if you're interested, if you're a, an organization in particular, um, if you, if you um, are in, interested in doing business in a foreign culture, in a market, you need to hire a specialist and generally a local specialist, a local anthropologist or a local business person who understands that culture and can help you overcome what we call the liability of foreignness. Right. So if you're familiar with the Uppsala model, uh, the aspect of an outsider who does not understand <laughs> the... M many participants here are 12, 13 years old. Okay. I kind of suspect <laughs> they don't know what Uppsala model is. Yeah. Internet research and then um, definitely consult the experts. Right, right. Yeah, probably have like a focus group or something. So always useful, yeah. I guess, you know, locals. One of the big advantages of Exculture actually is uh, for the client companies that we have students all around the world. This year we have uh, about 40 countries uh, where the universities that participate are from and then another 30 or so uh, for the kids. And so it is true that uh, students and kids may not necessarily be super smart and may not necessarily know a lot that the company doesn't know. But one thing they do know is something about their own culture. Yes. And so when they're developing the market entry strategy, uh, even if they don't have any special knowledge about business, if the company name sounds wrong, for example, in their culture, that's something they will identify right away. So it's almost like free market research. Uh, another question uh, that everybody is asking, or at least Edison is asked that one, and then there are a few other students, um, uh, cultural change. So do cultures change? If they do, how quickly uh, the difference in change uh, at the individual versus uh, change rate at the individual versus national level, or cultures are static, and that's what we're born with, and they stay the same all throughout our, our lives? Um, well, if we're talking about culture from the macro perspective, from a national perspective, for example, uh, that changes very slowly, generally, unless there is some kind of catastrophe that disrupts the culture. Uh, but you have deep level culture that is very, very resistant to change. So the values, the religious beliefs, the uh, basic ideals and ideology, those do not change rapidly. Uh, and when they do change, it is gradually and long term because of uh, agency within a given culture. So individuals changing what is acceptable uh, through interaction and discourse over time. Uh, but in terms of individuals, individuals' uh, personality and psychology can definitely change. Uh, and that is more of our uh, individual interpretations and expressions of culture. Now, depending on what a person's experience, they can become bicultural or multicultural. So myself, uh, again, born in Alabama, uh, small town Alabama, more of a rural conservative culture originally. But since then, I have lived other places in the United States as well as extensive time in Brazil. And I'm actually binational Brazilian American now and very much bicultural. So my culture individually, as well as my cultural identity, have changed. And that is through my personal experiences and most importantly, learning Portuguese. Uh, fluently. So when you become fluent in another language, it actually helps reprogram your brain to an extent. So you start thinking differently. And it's very interesting when you'll be speaking in one language versus another, uh, even about the same topic, you might have a slightly different perspective. Um, so yes, definitely individuals can have their personal culture change. Uh, and it is related to their experiences and education over time. I think I'm missing the audio yes. now. So we have uh, we 15 minutes left and we have 15 minutes. Um, in 15 minutes, a hard stop because we have the next webinar. So let's spend also some time talking about the administrative issues. But first, thank you so much, Eric, for your presentation. Uh, thank you. I've seen many presentations on culture and this one was not only probably the most informative, but also you literally packed into these, what, 30 minutes or so 
the material that normally would require a whole book or a whole semester to cover. So that's that was very very intense and can, uh, very informative. Lots of good examples. Oleg, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a question. I only uh, can, uh, have to add something. Hi. Yes. So, yeah. Go uh, ahead. Good day. Good day, everyone. Uh, Hello. Mr. Travis, thank you a lot for this interesting lecture. Um, and uh, you mentioned one of the Indian gods. Uh, it's uh, uh, Katana Mud Mudra uh, yes. or something s similar. Yes. And it, it's very uh, interesting because in Ukrainian language, I'm from Ukraine, uh, we mm -hmm. have a word, uh, Mudra. It means wise or smart. And uh, even more, it's a uh, very widespread last name in Ukraine. Oh, actually, I didn't ah, think about yeah. that. You're right. Interesting. I, I'm also, obviously, from Ukraine. So yeah, and <laughs> maybe we can uh, maybe we can even uh, explain uh, that if um, uh, we will see Ukrainian ancestors uh, of Ukrainian people uh, like. Sarmats, Sarmat tribes or Scythian tribes, because this mm. is Indo, Indo European, in, uh, Indian tribes from uh, Middle East and from the India. Definitely, there there is that that common heritage, their cultural health heritage from the original Proto uh, European or Indo Aryan cultures that have the common languages. So we can see yeah. how far back the languages diverged and uh, definitely still has an impact on culture. So it's really interesting to know mudra and it means something wise. You know, a, a not far off translation of the original Hindi hmm. uh, and Hindu concept. Interesting. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Let's spend a few minutes on the administrative stuff. Uh, so we have um, a few questions about um, this week's materials. Mehak, you said that you have some questions about this week's materials. Can you clarify, maybe raise your hand? And I see that Edison and Ahmed have questions. If you guys have questions about um, the administrative stuff, so I'm gonna add you to the panel here so you can ask your questions here. For those uh, who just joined, or just a quick recap, uh, so um, this will be the last week of theoretical training for the kids. So you have one more test to do, and then we'll take a week or so to decide who passes the theoretical training or not. So you guys have to be uh, very careful here in terms of uh, you know doing the test well. Uh, so far, it looks like not everyone will be able to advance to the practical stage, but uh, quite a few people will. And so it seems like as long as you tried uh, and attempted all four tests, you probably will be going and working in global virtual teams. We have a few people who missed a test. We will give them a chance to retake the test, but if you won't, uh, obviously we will not allow you to participate in the project. Uh, and the main concern is nobody wants a team member who is not disciplined enough to take tests every week. So if you are missing any tests, I think I send you the links for the missing assignments. If you make them up by basically tomorrow, you're good. If you miss them, I'm sorry, we have to be strict here. Edison, you had a question? Uh, yes. Go ahead, please. So if one of, like, if the cultures change and they get taken over, what, like, what will happen? So if cultures change and then kind of taken over by other cultures, you mean? So yeah. what happens? So is it possible that one culture absorbs the other or another? Is that what you mean? That's a good question. Yes. Hi, Addison. Um, Hi. We have had experience with that historically very, very frequently, very often um, through conflict, for example, through invasion, through war. Uh, and unfortunately, quite often, the culture that is absorbed loses a lot of its identity, especially through the imposition of the new language. So being forced and indoctrinated into a new language, into new uh, attire, into new behaviors through formal education systems and through uh, cultural norms that are imposed. So quite often, we see a diminishing or a loss of culture. Um, and at the same time, you do see certain aspects of culture that are either hidden or what we call syncretic cultures, where they blend the two cultures. The best example of this would be in um, some of the Latin American countries, uh, where we have the syncretism between African religions and Catholicism. So because of the history of uh, slavery and because of the history of colonization, the, the cultures that were conquered and were absorbed 
lost a lot of their cultural identity, but at the same time, they were able to retain some by basically hiding them or merging them with parts of the dominant culture. So in Brazil, we have Condomble uh, and um, some other religious aspects of spiritism, which mix Catholicism with some of the African religions. Uh, so that's a very good question, actually. And so you'll see that there is a loss of culture, a loss of cultural identity, but in some ways, uh, the cultures are able to maintain certain aspects of their language and their values uh, by combining them with the newer, the newer or dominant culture. Mehak is asking a question pertaining to this week's materials and specifically, uh, what is the difference between franchising and licensing? So it's a very good question. Um, we actually have quite a lot of reading materials, so it's a topic that may take a little bit more reading to understand. But briefly, uh, the difference between franchising and licensing is huge. Licensing, that's when you just simply sell a license and somebody makes the product completely and you sort of don't do anything with it, you just get your royalties. So for example, let's say uh, you made um, a movie and or a cartoon and there are some funny characters in that cartoon and somebody wants to make toys uh, with the images of those or in the image of those um, cartoonish characters. So you just sell a license and you say, okay, for every toy you sell, you will pay me 10 cents or maybe you'll pay me a million dollars a year and you can make as many toys as you want uh, with those cartoon, like for example, Mickey Mouse. So that's licensing. So you have nothing to do with the production. You have nothing to do with the distribution. You just get some money for your intellectual property, essentially. Uh, franchising, that's McDonald's, essentially. So you know how McDonald's works, right? So McDonald's, it's an organization that has all kinds of recipes and distribution channels and uh, all kinds of stuff. It does advertisement centrally. And so, and then a family comes to McDonald's or a person comes to McDonald's and says, I want to have a McDonald's restaurant and so they have a franchising agreement that person becomes that restaurant becomes a franchisee as they call it so that means that the restaurant will be managed by that person kind of independently but uh it will be part of the mcdonald's empire so mcdonald's will provide the supplies of food mcdonald's will provide the equipment which the person will have to pay for but still uh it will be kind of centrally provided by mcdonald's mcdonald's will do the um, advertisement it will provide the software for accounting so basically it will be kind of almost managed by mcdonald's but there will be a local manager so it's almost like a little sort of subsidiary so the involvement in a franchising is much greater than involvement in licensing it's not the same as a wholly owned subsidiary but it's kind of in the middle so that explains uh, the question all right let's see what other questions we have here uh, Irina is asking about the average scores uh, that are needed to advance to the practical phase um, I'll probably, I think it's okay if I were completely open with you about this issue here. Uh, so you have four tests and we repeatedly said uh, that you need to pass all four to be placed on a team, uh, on an international team. And uh, ideally we want you to get 80 or more on each of those tests. However, what do we do, for example, if somebody did all four tests, but on one of the tests, the score was, let's say 70. So it's lower than uh, 80. So does that person get disqualified automatically or uh, do we do something about it? The truth is we kind of take a closer look at situations like that. Uh, first of all, we have people of different ages taking these tests. And the list of questions is slightly different for older participants versus younger participants. Obviously, we expect much more from university MBA students versus kids who are 12 years old. So they see slightly different questions and the expectations are different. So if you happen to be, for example, a relatively young kid, uh, let's say 15 years old or 13 years old from a country where English is not the first language and you got 70 on one of the tests, it's probably going to be enough. So as long as you did all the tests, you attempted every question, you just you know, quite didn't meet that threshold, you probably will be okay. Vice versa, when we're looking at older people, especially those in the professional category, let's say you're 35, you're from the United States, uh, and you got 70 on the test. Not good. Even though your questions are a little harder, but from this level of experience, age, uh, preparation, obviously we expect better answers. So uh, to be sure, pass every test with 80 or more. 
to be sure do not miss a single test if you had a technical difficulty email us we'll send you a new link and you'll be able to retake the test if it was some sort of a technical issue uh, but if you happen to get a lower grade than expected on one of the tests probably you'll be okay as i said we'll have to take a closer look but probably you'll be okay um, so Samra is asking about joint ventures and I really like this question and here is why. Uh, most of the companies that participate in Exculture this semester are relatively small companies and that's intentional. Uh, we do work sometimes with very big companies like in the past we have uh, had clients uh, among companies like Mercedes-Benz, Home Depot, Louis Vuitton, those are huge big companies. But uh, we didn't like it's not that we didn't like working with them very much. The problem there is that they know so much and they have so much international business experience that students, uh, especially younger ones, can't really tell them much that they don't know. Whereas when we select smaller companies, like medium-sized uh, or maybe even very small, like startups, they're very, very interested in your ideas. They don't have many resources to research and do global market research. So obviously what the students recommend them, they, they, you know, they, they really need that information. At the same time, what that means is that they're relatively small and they cannot establish uh, wholly owned subsidiaries in foreign markets. So in most cases, when you recommend a client, an exculture client, that they should establish a wholly owned subsidiary uh, so that they can keep their trade secrets or have more control. In most cases, it's a bad idea because that requires a lot of money, a lot of expertise, entails a lot of risk. And for these smaller companies, usually it's not a good way to go. Even franchising does require some, you know, infrastructure in place and, you know, um, it requires a lot of work to do it right. Now, joint venture that uh, Samra is asking about actually may be a viable option. So a joint venture with the local partner may actually be a very good idea because this way the local partner knows the local reality, business connections, uh, how the market works, and may also contribute some resources. And so for these smaller companies, a joint venture may be a little bit, you know, you have to sort of relinquish some degree of control and you have to share, you know, control of the um, enterprise, but you also get some resources and local knowledge. So a joint venture may actually be a very good idea. And so what's very important here is when you will be recommending the, this option um, to your clients, it's always a good idea to give some suggestions as to who the local partner can be. So if you really want to impress your client, it's always a good idea to perhaps even talk to some local companies or maybe people in business that you know and check if they want to be a joint venture with your whatever partner country comes from. And so uh, in that case, you will be able to impress the client by saying, I think joint venture will be the best way to go. And here are some of the names or some of the companies that potentially might be willing to work with you. Moreover, I already talked to the CEO and they actually said, yes, they want to learn more. So if you do that, that would be very, very helpful. We actually have had cases in the past where students did it. And to my knowledge, it led to at least some discussions. I'm not sure if it led to the actual uh, you know, establishment of a joint venture, but they started talking. So that was very helpful that you kind of, kind of did that extra step. So let's see what we, what other questions we have. Uh, are we going to be able to select our client company, uh, Umbra? Yes. Uh, so in fact, Umbra, uh, we have already posted the list of the client companies that will be participating this semester. There will be probably two more. I'm still in negotiation with two more companies. So there may be two more added to the list but you already can see the full or almost the full list on the resource page. And uh, yes, this semester for the first time, we allow any team to choose any company. In the past, uh, we limited uh, the choices by age, but then some younger participants complained and said, even though we are young, we don't want to work on the school dream school challenge. We want to work on the real company challenge. So this time you see the whole list. And as long as your team agrees, you can choose any company that you know, you can work on any company. Um, Ahmed has a question for the speaker. Ahmed, um, why don't you email me or type it because we literally have one minute before I have to start a new webinar. So I want to make sure that we cover all the administrative issues. Uh, there is a question about symposium and it's a very good one. Uh, will I have to pay for participation and travel? Um, 
the answer is the short answer is yes you will have to pay for participation in travel the reason for that is um exculture is a nonprofit, so we don't have a budget that we get from the government or from somebody else and so when we organize these events the way it works is we book the venue uh, food transportation all of that you know and then basically just divide it by the number of participants and so this way everybody pays for themselves and we use that money to deliver the event so we don't really have the money to pay you for your travel however there are several things we will do to help you pay for your travel first uh, if you are invited uh, you will be allowed to give us names of potential sponsors who can pay for your trip and we will send them very strong support letters asking them to give you money and it works in many many cases I mean every year we have a lot of students who would go to a local company uh, the university they study at even to the mayor of the city I remember when we had the symposium in Miami Two years ago there were seven students from um, Italy who literally went to the mayor of their city and said we're invited to this event it's a big you know prestigious thing would you support us and so they got the money from the city so we'll give you that kind of support second uh, we are talking to our own partner companies asking if they are willing to support anyone and so in that case in many cases they say sure we can support one student or maybe two students in which case we ask them to give the money directly to you so it will not be money from us but we may be able to get some funding for some for some students but uh, the default option is uh, sign up only if you can pay for yourself so we cannot guarantee any funding and even though in the end it kind of works out in the way that everybody gets some support support either from us or from organizations that they may work with or associated with but again uh, no promises here so as I said we're not a rich organization that can pay for somebody's travel so the assumption is that you have to cover your own expenses so that's the plan um, all right so if there are more questions and I see that I didn't answer all of them I will try to go through them after the um, session and I will try to send uh, the, the answers by email to everyone but for now we have to stop because we have a webinar with the coaches so those of you who don't know we have 40 coaches 42 to be exact who will be helping you guys go through this project and so we have a webinar with them as well and I really need to go to that one so thank you so much for your participation thank you so much for your questions uh, Dr. Travis, thank you so much for your presentation. It was informative, even for me. I thought I knew a lot about culture and I found many interesting examples that I didn't know before. Thank you so much. And uh, I guess I'll see you next week. Uh, Karen, uh, did you have any last minute comments or questions or observations? I think your microphone is muted. Yeah, okay. So uh, based on the gestures, I think all is good. All right, thank you so much, guys. So if any questions come up during the week, uh, feel free to email me. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. Thank you.